Okay, today we are continuing our look. It's our final Sunday looking at the book of Malachi. Not a book that is read an awful lot or studied an awful lot, but I hope it's been one that's blessed you as we look through the questions that Malachi raises in this book and the answers he gives. Uh, next week we'll be starting a new sermon series. It'll be called Dinner with Jesus. And the idea there is we'll look at meals that Jesus shared with his followers and with others. Uh, these were often places where he gave teachings, often places where he taught the parables, but also the meals themselves were a lesson in grace and the kingdom of God. So we're looking at that next week. There are study guides already out there in the Narthex area and in the hallway. Uh, so this week, Malachi, questions, 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 and really we're looking at the last question, what have we said against you, which is really their way of saying, where's the justice? Where is God's justice in the world? And it begins, Malachi chapter 3, verse 13. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Well, arrogantly in what sense? Well, they're judging God. God is not living up to their high standards. He's not doing what they think he should do, not doing what they believe he has promised to do. And so they're speaking against him. You ask, what have we said against you? Verse 14, you have said it is futile to serve God. In other words, it doesn't get us anywhere. Have you ever had a job like that? Probably a lot of our jobs are like that, right? You serve dinner for your family, and the next day they want it again, right? Uh, uh, you clean the car, wash the car, and then, you know, it seems like it always is needing it again. Every job we do seems to be, have to be redone over and over again. And so they're saying, it's futile to serve God. We're out there doing this work, and they expect a reward. And we've talked about that already, but Hebrews 11:6 6 says, faith is this, that you believe God exists and that he rewards those who follow him. So that idea of having a reward in some sense is a part of it. We often, though, want rewards that go beyond what the faith promises. We want rewards that uh, are physical and we want them now at the moment we want them. In other words, we want to be in charge and God often is not living up to our high expectations, right? It's futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? Well, what does that mean? Well, we're doing all this work for God, and we also have to repent and go, oh, I'm so sorry. And that's a bummer. We don't like doing that. So uh, we want to uh, be joyful and happy. And, and God makes us do hard things, and it sounds like a kid whining, doesn't it? Right? And that's really what comes across. We'll talk about that later. And then it goes on, verse 15. But now we call the arrogant blessed. Who are the arrogant? Well, the ones who think they should be in charge, the self-made men who uh, worship their makers, that kind of person, right? Uh, the arrogant are blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. So they're doing things that they shouldn't, and they seem to be rewarded for it. And even when they say, God, are you watching? They get away with it, all right? We'll talk about that later, but a difficult theme. Is that true? Then it goes on, verse 16. This is a shift here. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. So there's a holy remnant present who are not participating in this apparently, or maybe they're participating in it, but it doesn't characterize who they are. This holy remnant says they talk with each other and the Lord listened and heard. So God's like an eavesdropper listening in on their conversations as they talk, but presumably they're probably including God in their conversation. It says this, a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. So there's a list being made. You know, what do they say about Santa? He's making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice. Well, here's a scroll of remembrance. We talk in the book of Revelation about the book of life, a scroll of remembrance. We know that the kings of Persia, and right at this time in its history, Israel is a part, a province uh, of the kingdom of Persia that the king kept rolls, uh, he kept a list of all the things that happened, annals of his kingdom. And if you think of the book of Esther, you might remember how King Xerxes is, can't sleep one night, and so he calls for his, his annals, his records to be brought to him so they can read them and put him to sleep. Sounds like an exciting book. And they come in to read them, and what happens, he, he remembers some of the things that had happened and taken place. And he learns especially about Mordecai and how he had rescued his uh, rescued the king, and how the king says, wow, I forgot about that. I need to reward this guy for that. Well, that's what they're talking about here, a scroll of remembrance. All the things are recorded down so they cannot be forgotten. Their names are recorded in this list, so they'll be a part of 
the kingdom of God, the part of the book of life. It's really just a way of saying in fancy terms that God will not forget who these people are. All right, their names, the righteous ones will be uh, remembered. And then verse 17, on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. So there's going to be a day of judgment, a day when God will act. Now, the Bible talks a lot about the day of the Lord. And sometimes what we wonder is, is it a day of the Lord or the day of the Lord? Because there are individual days of judgment that take place for people. There are days of judgment that take place for kingdoms. And then there's the day at the end of time when God will return and set all things right. And sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly which one of those is being talked about. In fact, sometimes it seems like multiple days like that are talked about. On that day when I act, says the Lord, they will be my treasured possession. So it may look like evil is triumphing, but that's only for a time. Eventually, God will set all things right. right? That's the promise that's given here. And then it says, I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. So the righteous will be spared and saved during this time of judgment. And then it says, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who did not. So there will be a distinction made. There will be rewards and punishments. And that's the vision that Malachi has for the future. And then it goes on, chapter 4. Surely the day is coming. So he says that it's not going to be forever. It's going to happen. It's going to occur. It will burn like a furnace. And all the arrogant and evildoer will be stubble, and the day is coming, uh, that, that is coming will set them on fire. So it says, well, they're going to be burned up. And I don't know if you do this. When I was a kid uh, growing up in Oregon, the farmers would set fire to the fields uh, after they had harvested the hay to burn them away. I remember vividly one time they, they did this in the afternoon, and uh, we didn't know, we were in a distant field working, and all of a sudden it got dark. And it seemed like Judgment Day had occurred. Because <laughs> it was 5 o'clock and, and it got so dark we were having trouble seeing. And it was just the clouds of smoke filling in from uh, the mo- many miles away. But exciting times there. Here he's predicting this time of judgment will come like that. And it's sometimes a little difficult, more difficult in the Hebrew than in the English to say, is it the sins of the things that will be burned away, people that will be destroyed? Anyhow, there will be a day of judgment that will take place. And then it says, not a root or a branch will be left to them. Things will disappear. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. So God's blessing will come. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Now that's a good verse, isn't it? <laughs> frolic like well-fed calves. I'm not a rancher. I've never been around that. I want to go, go Holly and Debbie, you grew up on, you worked on ranches. Do they frolic when they're well-fed? They're happy. So they've been kept there in their stall, they're released, they go running around and they're happy and they're gambling and that's what it's going to be like. We're going to be freed from all those things that have held us back, the sins that have been there in the world. And then it says, then you will trample on the wicked, they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. So it pictures this future when evil is destroyed, when evil things are gone and the good get to just triumph and and, and just, just enjoy everything. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. So remember how God blessed us with a law and rules for living. And then it finishes with this word of hope that is spoken to Christians. It says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Now, Elijah uh, was spoken of as the one who would come to herald in the Messiah and to herald in the kingdom of God. Now, Elijah is one of those characters who's interesting because he's one of two or maybe the only character in the Old Testament who doesn't die. Instead, he is taken up into heaven how? Chariot. That's why we sing sweet, swing low, sweet chariot. We're thinking of God coming to, to take us home. So he's taken home, and the idea is that he will return or one like him will return to prepare the way for the Lord. And we think of John the Baptist coming to prepare the way of the Lord for the coming of Jesus. But here it seems to be predicting that he will come before that judgment day to set, uh, to prepare things. And of course, we do remember that in uh, Jewish celebrations of the Passover, to this day, they still look forward to the coming of Elijah. And so during the Seder meal, at one point in the meal, they open the door and they, for Elijah to come in, just in case he's hanging there and this is the day, right? 
Uh, verse 6 says, He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? You ever not gotten along with your kids? You ever been wondering, how do we get along with our kids? How do I get along with my parents? You know, how do we make this work? Well, hearts will be turned during that time. That's the mis mes mission and message of Elijah, so that where re restoration takes place. And when families are right, it's sort of like everything else will fall into place as part of the idea. Uh, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. If that can't happen, it's going to be one or the other. Either things are going to change in one way or the other. Good things or bad things will happen. And that's how the book of Malachi ends. A strange way to end the book and the uh, Old Testament, but maybe not so strange because it talks about justice. It talks about judgment. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, we often hear the word just judgment and we think of condemnation. Justice is really about what? The word in Hebrew, and when they talk about it in Greek, also refers to right relationships. We want to have right relationships with God and with one another. And we want to see God's justice established on the earth. And when things get out of whack, when there are no right relationships, we trust in God's grace and God's mercy to restore, but also God's judgment. We look forward to a time when God will judge God, the omniscient, omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful one will set all things right. right. We look forward to that day. And the theme of judgment occurs over and over and over again in the Bible. There isn't a lot of talk about heaven and hell, but there is a lot of talk... Oh, heaven. There's a lot of talk about heaven, the kingdom of God. Not a lot of talk about hell, but there is a lot of talk about God's judgment, about how God will set all things right. So where's the justice? Does it ever feel like you're not getting the rewards that you deserve? Does it ever feel like others are not getting the punishments they deserve? You know? We had a, a similar question earlier in Malachi. There the emphasis was on why aren't the evil being punished. Here it's more on why aren't we getting the good things we deserve, but you could argue it either way. It's still a legitimate question to ask, a good question. Where's the justice? Where aren't I getting what I deserve? Well, we mentioned Hebrews 11:6 6 says, Faith is believing that God exists and that he rewards those who follow him. So what kind of rewards do we expect? Isn't justice a part of that reward? You know, we were talking in our men's group studying this passage this week, and one of the guys there said this week, I, I love this line, he said, you know, these, these uh, Hebrews in this book, they sound like a, a bunch of millennials. Where's the justice? What's in it for me? And I was thinking, boy, all we'd have to do is get a bunch of millennials, and they say, it sounds like a bunch of boomers. Doesn't it? You know, where's the justice? What's in it for me? Everybody wondering about what's in it for me. Uh, what, does, what is in it for us? Where's the justice? You know, in the Old Testament, of course, except for very few exceptions, there isn't a belief in eternal life in the way that we talk about it. There isn't a belief in the resurrection. Instead, they believe that people will die and they live this kind of vague existence. And indeed, many Jews, most Jews today, don't believe in a heaven. They believe instead that we die, that justice takes place here on this earth. And they believe then that God establishes his justice here and now. You think about that. Does God establish his justice here and now? Well, most of us say, would say yes. At least that's what we teach our kids, right? Be honest, you know, and people will believe you. Work hard and you'll succeed. You know, don't lie because then they won't believe you. Don't steal because then bad things will happen to you. As you sow, so shall you reap, right? If you work hard and gain wisdom, you'll be able to live a better life and you'll be successful. We teach our kids these kinds of things. But of course, there are exceptions. Uh, we see sometimes that evil people are successful. And is that the exception that proves the rule? Well, sometimes I wonder too if we always see what's really going on in people's lives. Uh, I remember when I was in seminary, I had a friend uh, who, wow, what a fantastic story. I won't even tell you all of the parts of his life, but he had one thing that I will share with you. He had grown up in an extremely wealthy family. His parents had divorced, and he loved his mother and his father, and uh, he, he, brilliant guy. He was a, definitely a genius. He goes off to Yale, and he's studying, and then he discovers something about his father. His father had run a charity, and he'd always thought he was a great, noble guy, <laughs> But he came to find out that this cancer charity that his dad ran was actually a giant scam. Yes, they did give some money to cancer, but over 90% of the money was taken by his dad, 
which explained how he was able to have a 15-acre uh, uh, compound just outside of Washington, D.C., with tennis courts, swimming pools, and a mansion. Wow, when he learned that, well, what would you do if you did that, right? This is what he did. He, he cut himself off from his father. He quit school. He joined the Marines, right? That's a pretty big reversal for a guy, right? Joins them, and then, weirdly, after about a year of serving in the Marines, he's in a motorcycle accident. And he wakes up, and he finds his dad there, right? His dad's there taking care of him. He's a physician, right? So he's there helping him and paying for a lot of his care and watching over him. And it takes him about two years to recover. Right? All the time his dad is there. And then he goes off, finishes college, goes off to seminary. There is where I meet him. And he's going, I don't know what to do with my dad. He says, I can't stand the guy. I love him. He obviously loves me, but everybody else has deserted him. In the eyes of the world, that guy's a success, right? He's rich. He's powerful. But he's a horrible, horrible human being. And nobody respects him. Who knows him, right? If you know the guy, you don't respect him. And he's got one person who loves him and can't stand him. Is he a success? Did he get away with it? You tell me. I met the guy. It didn't look to me like he thought he got away with it. You know, alone in his mansion with his tennis courts and nobody to play with. Right? That's really where he was at. So we wonder, do we get away with it? There are exceptions where it seems like the evil is getting away with it, where they're not being punished in the way we think. And there's a part of us that wants to see those punishments take place, although there's another part of us that says, thank goodness there aren't punishments that happen to everybody, because where would I be? Where would we be? There are major crimes, too, today that we wrestle with. You know, uh, sometimes I talk about criminal uh, punishments in the, in the Old Testament. People get very upset. They say they're always putting people to death or or punish them in some way, and I go, you know, uh, I work a lot with people in prison today or people coming out, and uh, I tell them, yes, it's not like our criminal justice system, which everything is so perfect, everything goes so well in ours. <laughs> and what I don't mean by that is not that the evil don't get punished, but uh, think of what happens when we uh, put people in our criminal justice system, you know? How do we set things right through that? Well, how do you set things right after a young father has been uh, murdered? How do you set things right after a teenager has been raped, after a senior citizen uh, uh, has their life savings stolen from them, after a family of four have been killed by a drunk driver or someone on meth? How do you put things right? I'm going to tell you right now, it isn't by putting somebody in prison. We may have to do that. We have to declare that something is wrong. We have to punish people and prevent it from happening again to do our best that way. Uh, but we all recognize that, that doesn't set things right. It doesn't fix things for that family. Right? We recognize that an injustice has taken place. And we recognize that this, the evil that exists in the world, you know, there's not a lot we can do about it sometimes other than to pray and to be there and to be a blessing. Right? We recognize there are many things we can't set right. Malachi also recognizes that, and so he looks to God's judgment to set all things right. A day of the Lord or the day of the Lord, we believe in both of them, right? Will take place and that God will set things right. We believe in a day of reckoning. You know, we've been talking about our last window that will go up, and uh, that will be a heaven window, you know, stained glass window that's the you know, space there. It's being worked on, and I know it's a gigantic job, so appreciate their efforts. And we've talked about how on the top there, there's going to be scales. And scales represent God's justice, God's setting all things right. But it's interesting how many people hear that as condemnation. Well, I guess there will be that, but there will also be righteousness and good things taking place, and God's setting things right and healing wounds that have occurred. God will judge things and make them correct. And I don't know how that's going to work. We believe in a God of justice. We also believe in a God of grace and mercy. Many people tell me, well, those are opposites. How can we believe in both? There's a God of justice and a God of mercy. How do they fit together? And I will tell you that I think when you think of them as opposing forces, you're seeing it incorrectly. You know, the book of Micah says, uh, this is what God requires. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. I have a friend who says, well, that is uh, impossible. You can't love justice and do mercy. And I think you can because I think they're really not opposing forces, but two sides of the same coin. Justice is really about establishing right relationships. 
and mercy is really about restoring right relationships. We can't do that in our lives perfectly or even very well sometimes, but we know that God can, and we trust that the, our Creator will set all things right at the end of time. I don't understand how He's going to do that, but I don't have to, and I don't have to understand how judgment is going to work. In fact, we're specifically told that we should not judge, that that is a realm that belongs only to the Lord. Uh, but that he will set all things right is, is a belief of ours, an axiom in our faith. One final thought. You know, Karl Marx was talking uh, about religion, and he didn't have a very high opinion of it. He said that religion was the opiate of the masses. And what he meant by that was that religion was one of those things that made everybody complacent. Because instead of focusing on the problems that existed here and now, they believed in some afterlife where everything would be set right so they just abandoned things here and now. Now, I'm going to tell you, there might be some little bit of truth in that, but I think, well, what do you think? Isn't there something wrong with his thought process there? Doesn't the belief that God will set all things right, that ultimately all things justice will occur, motivate us to establish justice as far as we're capable here and now? Shouldn't it motivate us as followers of Jesus Christ to work to establish justice in this world? Right? If we know that's going to be the final outcome, shouldn't we be working to have it take place now? That's the role that we're given, right? Christ gave us that role to be truth tellers, to be people who created justice in the world. Uh, I, I think that it should inspire us to go forward as servants of Jesus Christ. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this book. It raises a lot of the difficult questions of life, and it challenges us to commit ourselves to your cause and your kingdom. It raises questions and tells us that we can ask those questions, but it also challenges us to be people of faith in the midst of our questions. May we commit ourselves fully and completely to your gospel and to the furtherance of your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.